In this series, we're going to be inviting all sorts of thought leaders from the world of change, organizations, technology, agility, to come and talk about you know, key aspects of business today. On our first episode, uh, we've got Jax here, um, and we're going to talk about change resistance. We are. So I'm Jacqueline Shakespeare, and I'm a consulting partner here at SNS, and really pleased to be part of uh, the first Business Maverick show. Brilliant. Looking forward to it. So we're going to go to the whiteboard. So to me, it's things like this that make our work with clients really interesting. So it's not a paint by numbers. You can't have a great plan and just go along ticking the boxes. This is about people and this is about how they feel about change. So that's why I find things like change resistance so fascinating. Yeah, and it's a kind of an endemic problem, right? Because, um, you know, what big change have we ever done in an organisation, whether it's a digital transformation, whether it's moving a data centre, whatever it is, right, big organisational changes where it doesn't have a people impact, right? Mm. So, uh, and yet it's often the bit that's left to the end, um, or we'll do a bit of training at the end, we'll do some comms, you know, change management's comms. No, it's not, there's so much more to it than that. Mm. Um, but you're and right. you can't plan for this either, right? It's something that quite often happens in a very unforeseen way. So you might be able to predict some of it because it might be surfacing quite early on in, in the yeah. engagement, but sometimes it just, it'll, you'll just start to see a glimmer of it and you, you start to understand exactly how damaging that can be. And it's the sort of thing that's easy to ignore, but you really, really can't. Yeah, and that gets into the point about change management. Is that an oxymoron? Can we actually manage change? Yeah. I don't know. But so, let's talk about the resistance part, right? There's, yeah. there's, a, there's an effect of not getting change right that, that manifests itself as something called change resistance. Mm. So let, why don't we start off with recognising, what does that look like? How do people recognise change resistance within an organisation? Because it can manifest itself in different ways, can't it? Sure. And it can come through as actions and behaviours, and sometimes it's really blatantly obvious, and sometimes it's a lot more subtle. Mm -hmm. So it might be things like, um, it, it might be something near the end of the programme where you've put all these great things in place, you've done all your testing, and you've done all your training, and then you're failing to actually get the adoption that you, you originally intended, even though everybody's saying the right things. So you might see a failure in terms of people adopting yeah. the change. Okay. Um, and I guess you might also see things like uh, some sort of extreme behaviours, um, maybe people being obstructive, um, yeah. you know, not engaging with, with, with the change. So, so in terms of some of the... the some of the behavioural tools that we use, we might call that in terms of overdone strengths. So people become quite uncomfortable yep. in their environment and the things that are going on around them, so you'll start to see their behaviours change and, and might manifest themselves in, as you say, quite an extreme way and one that you aren't expecting them to based on the change that's actually in front of them. Okay, cool. So we're saying, let's, let's start here. So we've got, so there's a lack of adoption. Yeah. Maybe extreme behaviours. Yeah. And they might be sort of, you know, I hate to use the word toxic, but maybe yeah. problematic behaviours. It might be um, lack of engagement, so and that might come through in terms of refusing to come to some of your stand-ups or your training mm. sessions. Mm. People who are, and I guess this is related to extreme behaviours, is, is people that are actually detracting or going against, actually deliberately going against the change that you're trying to put in place, so doing the opposite. That's beautiful writing. It's not, I'm a really bad writer. Can you spell as you're talking or somebody's talking to you? Jesus Christ, I have trouble breathing and writing at the same time. Okay. What does change resistance look like? So lack of adoption. Um, and in fact, it's, it's really interesting. I worked on a, a programme once which was uh, implementing a, a new global video conferencing solution, which in many environments would be quite an easy change to put into an organisation, right? Yeah. You put a piece of technology in, people start using it and you walk away. But actually, it was such, it, it was an environment where time was money. Any additional click through was money. Mm. Uh, and the resistance from the people who were using it, which hadn't come through in any uh, earlier impact assessments or conversations with different groups, it hadn't come through at all. But these guys just blatantly refused to use it. And so, yeah. Actually, it was really interesting. We hit all the metrics that had been set, <laughs> but we didn't get the adoption from that small group of very influential people in the organisation. Whether we're hearing it explicitly or implicitly, yeah. uh, it's no. Sorry, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and in all of this, it's quite interesting. It makes me think, I, I worked somewhere once and, and uh, the director of retail used to talk about hearts and minds and she used to do that. I don't know if you remember. And people used to laugh at her 
when they did it, and she was quite new at the time. But looking back now, she was absolutely right, because to actually avoid change resistance, you've got to, you've got to pe win people's hearts and minds over, and it's kind of the, uh, the opposite of that, isn't it? What drives all of that? Why? I look at that and I think, well, why is that actually happening? Because to actually address it, you need to understand where it's coming from. Mm. And is it, I mean, what, is it, a lot of organisations struggle with the concept of change management. Oh, change management, let's just do some comms. Feels fluffy. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of senior leaders, I find, struggle with what change management really means. Oh, we'll give that to HR. Um, oh, it's just sending out some stuff on the internet. Um, and it's just so much more, it, unfortunately, it's so much more than that. Um, but it is about this, it's about trying to avoid this, isn't it? Avoid this response mm -hmm. by doing things in advance that get you the right thing. So, um, so, so maybe the, some of the drivers would be, um, number one would be maybe, um, uh, let's just say no change management, right? Or, or, or an immature view of what change management really looks mm -hmm. like. Um, and an understanding of the value that it brings. Yeah. I think that another one is that people are just exhausted by the amount of change. <coughs> fatigue, particularly yeah. at the moment, change fatigue. I think particularly at the moment, you know, we've all seen so much change in the last few months in all areas of the organisation. Mm. When, when we talk about more, people are just like, oh, no, not more. But this comes to the bit about, you know, do people hate change, right? No, we love change because we go on holiday, we move house. We love change, don't we? Yeah, we, we have cosmetic surgery, we buy new fashion. Where did that come from? Well, but in a load... But, but, <laughs> But the people love change. What they yeah. don't love is having is being changed by someone else. If they don't believe in it. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, so okay. So we've got you know, we, we, if we're not addressing change from a proper structured way, from a change management point point of view, um, if you've got fatigue in the organisation, is that a real one? Do you think? I mean, or is that just a consequence of life? We've got to get on with it. You know, we'd all love to sit and pause and. But it relates to this, isn't it? If you actually manage manage. Probably bad yeah. use of the word, but if you, if you lead, anyway. yeah. it is a bit of an oxymoron, but if you accept that, if you manage change properly, then you actually can do it in a way where people aren't fatigued by it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's also whether the change is real or not. You know, people experience change a lot and hasn't necessarily been successful, so they feel, oh, here we go again. Yeah. Especially when some of the change is structural. Um, you know, moving the deck chairs around. Mm -hmm. um, hey, we've done a real change. Well, okay, you haven't done any real change then. Um, and type, people, you're right, absolutely right. People are people have been on these pilots and these fads and these initiatives driven by management quite often. They fail or they fizzle out, and people are going, "Come on, I, I want change, but I want real change this time." Mm. Yeah, I love that. And sometimes, you know, it, sometimes it's just landed as a big shock as well, right? Um, yeah. We've not pre-warned with people, we've not warned people up, we've not framed it properly for them. Absolutely. Right? So it's a massive shock. It's like, well, this is coming out of the blue. Thanks for the heads up, everyone. Um, so that can be a real problem. Yeah, and I think that links to engagement. So then you, you, you then that links into all of the engagement pieces, you know, you know, what's in it for me? How does it align my value? What purpose do I have within the organization and what value I bring? So I think that links in nicely to all of those things. Yeah. And one I see a lot, and it's it's interesting whenever we're doing change. Um, the big picture's quite often, quite often quite easy to do from a rational point of view, mm -hmm. but what people do is internalise very quickly, mm -hmm. which is, okay, but what's this mean for me, mm -hmm. right? Um, so where do I fit? But that's, that, that relates to anxiety, okay? Yeah. So in, in, when you have anxiety driven by a change that's coming, it's a natural human state to go into yourself, mm -hmm. which then drives this. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and you struggle to then to see the bigger picture and, and the purpose and why it's happening. And that's why engagement as part of change management is so critical. You've got to do it really carefully so that people are gently taken through that journey. Yeah. And I guess one of the other ones which, uh, which I often hear is, um, I, I don't feel I've had a say in this. Mm. Uh, and I think this is a really key one um, because people do actually like change. They want change. Um, but if they feel it's being done to them, that they, they haven't had a say, and it doesn't mean they have to be involved in everything. It doesn't mean they have to be the, the designer of everything. We don't have to involve a thousand people in this. But I don't want it done by a bunch of people yeah. in a darkened room somewhere and then a big, ta-da, here's the answer, when you don't really understand my problem on the front line. Um, so, so, you know, this is a key one, really, and this is one of the, the key things we do, is really trying to help people co-create part of this, to feel they have a voice, they have a part of it. What else? 
So I think another one for me is this feels overwhelming. It feels like everything's changing. Mm. Um, and also people are nervous about the transition rather than the actual change that's happening in front of them. I'm going to say no edges to the change. Yeah. I quite like that term. It's, uh, you know, it feels like the whole flipping world is yeah. being turned upside down. Can't see the wood for the trees. Um, yeah. yeah, and sometimes it's a really key one. You know, um, when we're pre-warned that there's something coming, when we're told it's only this bit, we're shown quite quickly where we fit in. We're allowed to co-create. You know, suddenly change happens a lot mm. easier. Right? It's quite, it's not difficult, this stuff. But, but it's amazing how many organisations... Yes, it is. But that's the thing. It is difficult because it's about people. Well, if it was easy, we'd all be doing it brilliantly. Yeah, maybe that's my own bias. Yeah, yeah. it is your own okay. bias. I think there's one more for me, which is I don't see how this fits with my values. And that be, might be more of a specialist one. But mm. I certainly know for me, I become much more anxious at work if, I, if I'm in a space where I don't feel it fits with my values. So if I don't understand mm. or if I don't believe the change is the right one, I think people struggle with that a lot more. Yeah. I think there's one more thing to add to this, which is learning anxiety. So yeah. I think sometimes people are very comfortable in their own space, they're very comfortable with the capabilities that they're responsible for and the job that they're being asked to do, and that unknown generates anxiety because they think, well, actually, I don't know whether I am, even if I want to, I don't know whether I'm able to step into that new space. Yeah, I, I, it's a, I'm back to a beginner again. Wow, there's some... So we've got a lot there. So we've got, what does it actually look like? How do I recognise it? We've got what's actually driving it. Should we talk a little bit about what we can do? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. There's a bit of a model for this um, where we have two things, learning anxiety and survival anxiety. So here we change because, um, uh, because it, our survival depends mm. on it. And here, this could stop us. If this is too high, this could stop us from, uh, from learning. Stop us from changing because we, we're worried about uh, learning anxiety. So you know, usually these are kind of in that situation in a normal organization. And then we have that kind of uh, burning platform speech, you know, the company's in crisis um, and uh, the CEO stands up and goes, we all need to change. And suddenly this spikes up here. And this can be great for trying to mobilise people, right? It's that survival anxiety and it can be can work, platform. Yeah, it can be work yeah. really well, except it can be quite short lived. Because unless, once we've moved away from that, that sort of town hall meeting, um, two days later we're back at our desk doing the same things we were always doing, going, not sure much has changed, right? So this comes down quite quickly, and then the low anxiety prevents us changing. What we should do instead is not focus on this one trying to mobilize through burning platforms and an urgency but instead try and reduce learning anxiety mm. so that that prompts change on the back of it so we've we've looked at uh, what does the resistance look like how do i recognize that in my mm. organization and we've looked at the driver so we're understanding where it's coming from how do we work to make sure it doesn't happen so what do we do early on in the change engagement to try and prevent some of this, to help people as much as we can. Yeah. So there are a few things that we can do, aren't there? Yeah, so I think, um, whilst I said uh, change management is not just communication, communication is an important part of change management, right? So, um, so communication is, is really key, and you, you need to over-communicate, right? I think there's an old saying that you need to tell someone seven, something seven times for them to hear it the first time. Yeah. Um, and, and it's amazing how many times you can have that big town hall meeting and everyone's talking about the market and our opportunity and whether we're going to innovate and everyone's sitting there going, where's our department? Are, they, are we going to get five? Right? And so, so we have to keep reframing, re-communicating, re almost, almost to the point where you're being relentless at it and almost over-communicating. It's interesting you mentioned framing because that's really one of the first things that we should focus on, helping people put the change into context and understand mm. why. And there's a nice little story about President Kennedy in the early 60s where we went around the NASA Space Center um, and he noticed one of the janitors and he went over and he introduced himself, said, hi, I'm Jack Kennedy, you know, what do you do here? And the guy stopped his work and he said, I'm helping put a man on the moon, which is really, really nice because actually he's not cleaning a floor. He could see his greater purpose. He could see the frame of it. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important, whatever job we do, to have that understanding in terms of what value we're adding to, to the overall purpose or ambition of the organisation in our case. And that's just good advice for any organisation, right? Absolutely. You know, whether you're going through big change or not, mm. everyone should feel that bigger purpose. I'm not here shuffling paper around and you know, colouring and moving on. I'm actually part of building that thing for the customer over there that's driving that big sense of purpose. I'm gonna, the second one for me 
is co-creation. So you mentioned something earlier on about working together. Yeah. You know, people don't want to, uh, people want to have a voice. You talked about not having a voice. Yeah. And this is yeah. how we help people have that voice. It's how we engage them. Uh, you know, I worked with a client not so long ago and the technical team were doing a fantastic job at designing this new uh, piece of infrastructure. And they were telling people about it. So there was a lot of informing going on, a lot of communication. But the CFO came to me in the end and he said, I just need your help because I just, it, they're talking a convincing talk, but I just, I'm just not convinced by it. I don't believe in it. Mm. So actually what we did, we took all the key people away um, for five days in a big room, brown paper around all the walls, and we visualised everything. And then I deliberately invited some of the key stakeholders to drop in whenever they wanted to. And then somebody from the team would literally take them through the story and where we were. And we went from the purpose, what we're going to be doing, how we're going to be doing it, it literally drew everything out and at the end it was a really easy pass through finance because they were like yeah we get it we've been part of that engagement we've been part of the story and we feel we've contributed to this now and that is so critical in terms of engaging people yeah so and co-creation part part of co-creation is authorship the feeling mm. you have some level of authorship of of the change and i think um you know when we at sns when we talk about change people change there's there's really three ways of doing people change right First one is actually the most common way in organizations, which is a rational approach to change. I'll talk, you listen, we do comms, we do PowerPoint, we do training, right? And that's kind of the, the when we don't understand this, that's, that's the, the default method. And, and you're, you're absolutely right here, your point about um, if it fits with my values, I, I can work, that approach can work. Yeah. Um, uh, hey, I'll get something out of it, I get an extra three hours for lunch, great, that'll land really well. Um, but when we're trying to do things which fundamentally, cha fundamentally challenge the mental model they have, yeah. then, then we start to bang up against uh, problems. So, so the first way is a, is a rational approach to change. Um, can work occasionally. If you're trying to do anything remotely complicated, not the preferred method of doing it. Mm. Second way is a coercive way of doing ch change. So yeah. big, big stick, little carrot. Um, you know, it, all you get out of that is compliance, um, and usually short-term compliance, and that's, and that's the problem. You don't get commitment. Um, and uh, you know, don't use it as a strategy, although I think there's probably some organizations that do. Um, occasionally as a tactic, maybe, um, but, uh, but it's not, not a great method for doing that. Mm. The third way is the way we use, um, which is a normative approach to change. A normative approach says, uh, we're here to help you study the system in front of you, the things that are going on, the policies, the people, the processes, the interactions, everything. So when we do that and we start to look at things, we'll discover things. We'll discover things that are, aren't working right. And we go, oh, wow. I didn't know that. It wasn't intended to do that. We tried to do these things so that something different happened, and that's really interesting. And when people are part of finding, discovering problems, they accept and go searching for new solutions, right? And so they do feel they've been part of co-creation, really yeah. finding those problems, understanding it, authorship. I'm, I'm now part of identifying what the solution might be. And for us, that's by far the most preferred method of any type of complex change. Yeah is using a normative approach which really involves authorship um, and co-creation. This doesn't mean we hand over everything and, and uh, you know, they, they write everything. Um, we give them a framework, we give them a voice, um, and, uh, and they feel part of it. They've be, they be been listened to, your point. Um, here. Mm. So brilliant, we talked a little bit about what change resistance looks like. We talked about some of the things that are causing it to happen and then some of the ways in which we can, we can improve that um, and prevent it happening in the first place. Um, Thank you very much, Jax. So in part two, we're going to explore a little bit about what we can do if, if we haven't got everything prepared up front and it is yeah. there in front of us, what can we do? Yeah. Okay, great. Sounds good. See you in part two.